Friends, a uh, very warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, if you're new, very warm welcome indeed. James, welcome to you. Thank you very much, Ian. Good to see you again. Just to remind folk where you are again. Uh, yeah, so I'm in um, two villages just north of Cambridge, Histon and Impington. Good. I'm glad you took my question literally where you could have taken it sort of existentially. Where I could I? have done where? and uh, we might have been here a very long time. <laughs> We might return to that question of our passage today. Um, folks, before we go any further, just to say, those of you who are returning to, very good to see you again, for you to see us again. Very good to have you join us. Don't forget, three things you can do to help us. I usually only mention two, but uh, three things to do, which is on the buttons below, you can like this video, which apparently helps it in the YouTube rankings. You can subscribe with the button down here uh, so that um, you don't miss out on future episodes. And even better, if you've enjoyed this and think it's useful, we'd be very grateful, wouldn't we, James, if you shared it. So you can click on the link, uh, click on the button, you get a link and you can paste it on social media or email it around all your friends. We would like that, wouldn't we, James? We would. That would, that would, that would be fantastic. I mean, um, but I have, I have heard amazing stories. In just this week, I've had somebody apparently um, in Guernsey who watches us. So Great. big shout out to them. Um, hey, hi there in Guernsey. Yeah, and also somebody in uh, New Zealand. So uh, very, very kind. We have got we have got listeners all over the world. I was going to say good day, but that's what people say in Australia, isn't it? That yeah, would be I don't, I don't want to say New Zealand. A bit more um, refined, I think. Perhaps. You say kia ora. I do. Right. Okay. You do. Okay. Well, kia ora to all our viewers in New Zealand. Great to right. have you with us. Now, James, before we plunge into our passage, which is the first Sunday of Trinity uh, in the year C, um, we had an interesting comment last week. One of the um, people who watched the video said, great video, thank you very much, but Ian, you should wear your dog collar. It would give you more authority. <laughs> James, do you think you it would give me... <laughs> well, would you think it would give me more authority if I wore my dog collar? And I... do you think wearing a dog collar is a good idea? I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't wear dog collars when I'm in the company of people who know what I do for a living. Right. <laughs> so, okay. um, in a sense, it, it seems a bit superfluous, really, um, mm. because, you know, it, it's a useful it's a useful thing to wear when one is sort of outward facing yeah. um, with, with people who don't know your role and you're perhaps in a, in a setting where you, you have a particular function. But mm. I, I don't think it's particularly useful at other times. And I feel pretty convinced that you wearing a dog collar doesn't really can put any more authority on you than you already have. I've seen you wearing a dog collar and actually it always looks slightly odd to me. So <laughs> I've known you too long. <laughs> oh, right. OK. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Ian. Well, there we go. <laughs> You're expecting uh, we, a more flattering we, reply. Th thank you. We, we could sort of have a discussion about what's sometimes called intrinsic authority and extrinsic we could, authority. We could. Yeah. Where, yeah. How would you understand the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic authority, James? Well, I mean, I think intrinsic authority is 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 what is within, isn't it? It, it it's mm. it's there because God has given it, and and it it it's, well, it, it is seen by everybody because it's inherent in, in the nature of yeah. the person. Extrinsic is something that's imposed from outside, and therefore you need symbols to show it. Right. Um, okay. I, I, that's my understanding. I, I, I okay. So at the moment, you're leaning on your extrinsic authority, and I'm leaning on my intrinsic. Well, authority. I, I'm not leaning on it. I'm, it just happens that it's Sunday, and I've <laughs> been wearing a dog collar. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't always, but we seem to record most days when I'm wearing a dog collar. But I'm I'm very happy to be in or out of a dog collar, whether I'm preaching or doing something like or whatever. It really doesn't bother me. So. Great. I thought I once read many, many years ago, Irenaeus say, I would rather people knew I was a bishop by my manner of life than by yeah. my manner of dress. Yeah. However, I've never ever managed to track that quotation down, so I don't know. Ah, how that. frustrating! Yeah, yeah. So maybe one of our wonderful viewers, whether in Guernsey or New Zealand, uh, would or anywhere else in the world, come to that, yeah. would tell us whether or not that's true. Yeah, and you know, I mean, if you'd got, caught me yesterday, if we'd recorded yesterday, you'd have had me in my welding gear. I was learning to weld yesterday, so wow. um, you know, it, it comes in. You know, you've got to take all yeah. cameras. Really. Okay, <laughs> that would have been difficult to see you through the mask. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's move swiftly on to our reading for this yeah. week, which is James. Yeah, Luke, you your finger on the pulse of the readings. Yeah, Luke chapter 8, uh, 26 to 39, and mm -hmm. it's the story of the healing of the Gerasene demoniac. Yeah, right, which I is interesting. Because, well, it's interesting from all sorts of points of views. First of all, my first question when we looked at this is. We've just had Pentecost and now we're in the Trinity season. So what on earth are we doing reading this passage? Mm, yeah, good question. Did you feel there were any connections with the season we're in? Well, um, I, I, don't, I didn't really think about that, actually. I, I suppose um, I, 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 there is, of course, 
something here about you know the most high god there's about jesus in his ministry um but there's not much about explicitly about the power of the holy spirit or anything like that so I, i'm not sure that um but you know um the spirit is powerful in jesus uh, you know in luke uh, mm. and it's a theme that's explicit in the early narrative in the early mm. chapters it's kind mm. of implicit isn't it really here mm. by this stage in luke so maybe maybe there is something there about it but I mean, who knows what the uh, <laughs> what the lectionary the mind compiler of the lectionary is compiler, up to? Isn't it? The mind of a lectionary compiler is a great mystery of the universe, and we're unlikely to plumb it. And it might simply be that we're returning to Luke, and we are continuing reading through his yeah. gospel. Uh, absolutely, season, which is fantastic unfolds. to do this, and and it is really great to have this uh, long run mm. of Lucan passages, isn't it? Mm. Um, the first thing that that struck me, and I mentioned this in the uh, commentary that uh, I posted up yesterday, is that um, I find it really interesting that they sailed to the Gerasenes, which is literally, yes. literally, Luke says, opposite Galilee. Well, it's, yeah. it can't be opposite Galilee because Galilee isn't a particular place. It's he yeah. must mean across the other side of the, the, lake. the lake. Yeah, and of course, by that he's meaning, and, and the phrase that Mark uses is they sailed across the lake. But of course, they're always talking about sailing across the, the top oh, part of the lake, yeah. not sort of across the middle. They're cutting off the corner normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then Jesus. So they sailed, but Jesus steps out of the boat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely and amazing. It's very striking, isn't it, in this narrative mm. that it, that if, <laughs> as I say it's it's all about Jesus. The 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 answer is always Jesus. Um, I never tire of repeating that little joke about the boy in Sunday school and the teacher yeah. says, you know, what's the school, what's what's grey and got a bushy tail and berries nuts the winter and the boy at the back says, I, I, I know the answer is always Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. Squirrel. But there is an amazing focus on Jesus here. The, the, the yeah. disciples just sort of disappear. Yeah, they do. And, and it, you feel as though really the only the only two, especially in the first part, the only two characters are the man and Jesus almost alone um, mm. Mm. with with one another. And um and actually, you get back to that at the end as well, I think, in the dialogue right at the end of the passage where uh, the man wants to follow Jesus, but but Jesus sends him away. And you, you kind of have mm. this impression again uh, of this one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation that's going on mm. between them. Mm. Yeah. In some ways, it's kind of a Johannine focus, isn't it? Because the fourth gospel is often filled with these one-to-one yeah. -one encounters where the, where the disciples simply aren't there at all. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you think that's connected with the previous passage? Because um, we, oh my goodness, we, we looked at it weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks ago, even though yeah, it's just yeah, immediately it's before, yeah. it's when Jesus um, calms the storm as they've, as they've been sailing across. Yeah. I, yeah. Wondered whether, I wondered whether the focus on Jesus is because the poor white-haired, <laughs> terrified disciples are still cowering in the boat, boat yeah. after this terrifying episode with the storm. Yeah. So the last thing you want to do is encounter this terrifying man. Yeah, and but the, there's also connections, aren't there, here about I suppose how how particularly people in the ancient world understood the, the power of evil forces in the sense that in the boat, you know, there's the power of of nature, the power mm. of the storm, the, the, mm. the power of the winds and the waves which threaten life. Mm. Um, and and here we have something which is, I suppose, we would regard as more explicitly evil, but actually in in their understanding would be a similar kind of kind of nature really that mm. it, it's it's something that's uncontrollable as a human being you can't do anything about these two forces and yet yeah. jesus comes along and actually he is sovereign over both of them mm. so that's quite interesting um these two stories being alongside one another and it also touches on something that we feel very deeply and i think people in every age are very deeply which is this um deep misgivings about thing, things that we can't control but also things that we don't understand yeah um and i, I again it's it's imagine it's imagining ourselves back in an age where you you didn't have an app on your phone to predict the weather and when i mean i, I when i'm taking barney out barney and my dog out for a walk i look on my app and i can see which at which minute yeah. the rain's going to stop so i can go out then and yeah and that's but actually knowing what the weather was going to do is a very recent thing so and you know even 20 30 years ago whether it was going to rain later today was a, was a bit of a mystery yeah and, and if you live by the sea then the the sea is a a, a strange malevolent powerful force which yes. you, um, yeah. and again i think until even still now very recently um the, the kind of however you understand what this man's going through it's a terrifying thing yeah yeah absolutely um, yeah now uh I, one of the things I noticed next in the blog is that it seems to me 
that Luke's account follows Mark's account in actually being chaotic. The narrative yeah. Is, yeah. is chaotic. Mm -hmm. So Jesus steps out of the boat. The man come from the city comes with demons. And then we start the description of him for a long time. He'd worn no clothes. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him uh, and, and said, for Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit. So we've got everything out of order here. So Jesus yeah. steps out of the boat. Then we learned a bit about the man. Then we learned that he falls down. Then we learned that already Jesus has been commanding. And then uh, Luke carries on. Oh, I've forgotten to actually to give you the full description of who this guy is. So we actually get yeah. in, in a little version yeah. I'm looking at the, the descript further descriptions in brackets. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because Luke yeah. normally likes to sort of like straighten things out and smooth things out and have everything in the right order. Yeah, yeah. He is normally a very... Uh, but the thing is, he, he is, of course, an excellent storyteller. Um, mm. He is a mm. master storyteller in many ways. And I think he's using a... An, I, it seems to me he's using a technique here uh, to express what is actually going on in the story. There's this... Mm. I mean, there's this utterly chaotic man um, who who is just... You know, I mean, his whole life is chaotic. Mm. And in a sense, the way the narrative unfolds uh, reflects that chaotic uh, yeah. nature. But also, I think the story does really, I've always, I've, I mean, I've always liked this story. Um, I know it, it sounds bizarre to say that, but it, it does mm. suck you into it. Mm. It does pull you in. It reads really, mm. really well. Mm. Um, and that there's something about about that, that that is just down to Luke being a brilliant storyteller, I think. It would be an interesting experience, wouldn't it, to have this acted out as a dramatic reading yeah. in church yes. on Sunday? Yes. Uh, any volunteers to be the demoniac? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's, there is a, it is, well, I suppose one of the reasons why it's such a striking story, you say it draws us in. Mm. It, it, there seems to be lots of shouting going on. Yeah. So yeah. Jesus is actually shouting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, he commanded him, I think Mark says, he commanded him a loud voice, if I remember me correctly. I, I haven't right. looked it up, it just occurs yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, you've got this, this kind of shouting, shouting match going on, and it's all pretty chaotic. So it could be, it could be a very dramatic... Uh, it could be uh, very uh, dramatic, uh, yeah. Dramatic yeah. And, and um, the swine get drowned, that could even be more dramatic. That'll, okay, that would be lots of... <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, if any of you do do a dramatic reading like that, do please yeah. let us know. We'd no, love to we'd see love it. To, yeah, in fact, yeah. even if you could give us a link to the video, we'd post it up on YouTube. That would be yes. that would be even better. Um, the, the other thing that strikes me about this and the fact that Luke doesn't straighten the order out is I just checked up, and this is really interesting, that quite often uh, Mark's version of a story, although he has fewer stories, mm. Mark's version is longer. Yeah. yeah. And Luke and Matthew abbreviate, but I actually just checked. Um, and in fact, not. in this case, mm. Luke's version is almost exactly the same length as Mark's. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas Matthew's is half the length. It's very, very much yeah. abbreviated. Yeah. Um, so it, it seems to me we've we've got a sort of Mark Luke uh, melange here. So L yeah. Luke is Luke is using some of his own language, but actually quite often he's staying with the same language as Mark. Yeah. Um, so he obviously finds Mark's version compelling. I think probably most of us know Mark's version yeah, yeah, uh, better than Matthew's yeah, or Luke's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a couple of things then in the in the wording here that Luke uses, which mm. seems to me to be um, significant. Uh, and the first is that um, he describes uh, the fact that um, this is uh, a desert place. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Except I've just man. lost the track of which verse. It's on know. verse twenty-nine. It's, it's it's at the end of verse twenty-nine, I think. Oh yes, yes, yeah. it has. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And he the, he was driven by the demon. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm. He was driven by the demon into the desert. Yeah, yeah. I, it's absolutely fascinating this because, of course, in Luke four, Jesus is driven by yeah. the Holy Spirit into the desert. Yeah, and he emerges triumphant from the desert yeah, experience yeah. with the, with the evil and here the man is driven into the desert by by the demonic by the demons mm. but he's he's um rescued by jesus who of course is we know by now is lord of the desert um he's mm. lord mm. of the place of encounter with evil so mm. I, I, that's a there's a fascinating kind of connection i think there between mm. jesus mm. own experience in the desert and this man's mm experience in the desert jesus is the one who who can bring people out of desert out of the desert out of that experience of mm. uh of evil yeah and it, it, as we noted when we discussed this passage the temptation of jesus that for luke um again this is particularly connected with the spirit because mm. uh he is sent by the spirit he's actually luke says that um jesus is he sent goes into the desert full of the holy spirit full of the holy spirit yes yes in Mark, then he comes he comes after testing he comes out of the desert full of the 
power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit yes. That's so we 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 talk, we talked about yeah, it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So interesting. But, which is fascinating. And mm. um, the second thing which is striking here. Now, this isn't distinctive Luke and language, but it's significant, distinctively significant for Luke. Mm. And uh, if he's writing, assuming he's writing to um, a more Gentile, a mixed Jewish Gentile, yeah. but more, more yeah. predominantly yeah. Gentile audience, which is that the significance of the fact that the uh, demoniac uh, shouts out with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Mm -hmm. And that seems to me that that's going to be highly significant, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. significant within Luke's Jewish narrative, yeah. but it's particularly significant for um, a non-Jewish reader. Yes, here. yes, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting. I think you point out on the blog that this connects this story with um, Acts 16, where the the um, there's the slave girl who's being exploited by her owners, and, and there's this oh, yes. with Paul. Yeah. Um, and and I, it, I think it's really fascinating that in both of these stories, there is a, Jesus has a significant economic impact. Um, so, mm. you know, the swine are you know, clearly a significant part of that economy in, mm. in, in the country of the Gerasenes. But of course, in Acts 16 also, I mean, Paul incurs the wrath of the slave girl's owners because their mm. source of income mm. has mm. been dried up by the power of Jesus to release people from evil. And mm. uh, it seems to me that that's a really interesting thing that we, we, mm. we need to get our heads around, actually, that, mm. you know, um, there, there are consequences, economic consequences, to the power of Jesus Christ in in our world mm. today, as it as mm. it was then. Mm. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's all sorts of interesting uh, ideas. I mean, for Paul, he goes on his experience in Ephesus, isn't it? Where again, yeah. the uh, the business of the silversmiths is undermined yeah, by the fact that people are throwing away their ideas. Chapter and yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I wonder if there's a connection here. I don't think it's made explicitly in the text, but the fact that Jesus uses the word mammon for mm. wealth, so that um, wealth becomes a kind of a rival god. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, he's saying right at the very beginning that that following him has economic consequences. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Right. Um, yeah. And and of course, um, Luke is at pains to point out the uh, economic consequences for the community, so that he puts you know right up front in Acts two forty two yeah. in those verses the fact that um, the disciples, the believers, uh, were united in uh, one heart and mind, and uh, they, they together common, attended yeah. teaching, and they and they held everything in common, and there was no one who 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 was in need because they shared their economic resources. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the other connection, of course, that's a connection ahead to Act sixteen. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. Of course, the other connection is, is backwards, isn't it? To mm. uh, Gabriel to talking to Mary. Mm. So mm. it's the power of the Most High. Yeah, who will, who yeah. will come upon yeah. her? Yeah. Again, there's a sort of implicit link to the Spirit, isn't there? Because the the the, the Spirit, the power power from high shall come upon you. The Spirit of, uh, shall shall be hover over you. And uh, for Mary, the and the giving give birth of Jesus. And then, of course, in at uh, the beginning of Acts as well, we get a similar kind of language where the the, the power from the high will will yeah. um, come upon yeah. you, and yeah. you will be my witnesses. Yeah. And and, and there's a, as it were as it were the birth of this new Jewish missionary movement. Yeah, and uh, I mean the other thing that's interesting about this Son of the Most High God is that the, 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 the demons have to speak the truth. I mean, this is this is a feature of demonic encounter with Jesus, isn't it, in the Gospels? That yeah. they they know exactly who he is, and it seems that they have to say mm. exactly who he is. And mm. it's almost as if in the face of the one who is the truth, they they the, the demonic has to speak the truth. Mm. I think that's a really interesting because it it's you know we would we would think of evil as deceptive and you know um constantly trying to deceive us and uh, and hide and the truth that, and hide mm. the truth but actually yeah. in in the face of encounter with the you know the living embodiment of all that is true mm. they they have to speak up um mm. i've always been fascinated by that i don't i don't quite know where that that leads us ultimately but it is really interesting but it does mean that some of the most extravagant christological claims yeah. actually are on the yeah. <laughs> come from on the, on the lips of the yeah. Yeah, exactly yeah. yeah yeah now we then get into this dynamic about um we get the explanation of, of, yeah. of the, or luke completes the explanation of who this person is and then of course with this we get this sort of name thing so jesus says what is your name to which he replies uh mine or in, in um the, the, here's again a stylistic change so Luke has him say legion and then Luke explains for many demons that entered him whereas of course in Mark he says my name is legion for we are we many, are many. Yeah. yeah sounds does sound like a line out of a some sort of horror film yeah um, yeah yeah uh, and 
a couple of things here. One is, is this to do with, is this to do with an ancient belief that if you know someone's name, you have power over them? Mm. I think the other question, which is raised particularly by Ched Meyer's comment from some commentary from some years ago, um, Binding the Strong Man, mm. uh, where he sees political significance to this. So mm. the, 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 the kind of metaphor is that, uh, of the word legion obviously alludes to or uses the language of um, the Ro Roman occupying army. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's as if the, the demons here are an occupying power who have no real right in the man's life and, and, mm. and Jesus, it, it drives them out. So I suppose the question is, in which direction is the metaphor working? Is this mm. really about taking a military or political metaphor motif and using it to explain what's going on in this man's life? Or it is, is Jesus delivering of the demons actually making a political statement? Mm, yeah it's, it's quite a puzzle this isn't it i i, I uh, the, another commentator also links the, think thinks there's a sort of uh, um, almost a bit of humor here in that the, the legion legion goes into the pigs <laughs> so that there's this associate this association between rome and and swine <laughs> um yeah, you know yeah. and that actually i think that has more power for me than than the the the, the issue of the um uh, you know the, the the wrongly directed metaphor or whatever it is I, I okay think. Yeah. um but uh, it's a tricky one um it, it, yeah it, it is it is a bit of a it is a bit of a tricky one i mean clearly in the in the minds of everybody in those times the in, the power of rome is is very very dominant isn't it yeah. Um, yeah yeah um but of course the difference is that he drives the demons out yeah. uh but he does not drive the romans out no and, no, it, yeah. and in that fact um, and that's exactly why it's a problematic uh, yeah 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 okay um the large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside and they begged him to enter these and he gave them permission yeah and the demons came out of the man and into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned mm. is that a change of language from uh mark or not i should have checked i don't know i can't I remember think. What is it? What is really interesting about uh, about this encounter, though, which I always mm. think isn't commentated enough on in in the commentaries, is that here we have demons bargaining with Jesus. I mean, this is I think this is unique in mm. in, in the mm. Gospels, isn't it? Normally, it's just the command of Jesus, um, and yet, uh, so you're kind of left with this question: Why on earth does Jesus actually engage in a bargaining uh, encounter? with the demonic why doesn't he just destroy them and i suppose uh, in tr i'll try to answer that question I, I think jesus would only have bargained with them if if it was going if what happens is going to bring more glory to god mm. more more revelation of who he is and who god mm. is mm. and that seems to be what to me what actually what actually happens because um, in a sense the nature of evil is is exposed even more mm. because they don't want to go into the abyss yeah. Um, but then they go into the swine and then the swine drown. So they do go into the abyss, if you see what I mean. So, yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. it seems to me that he's exposing the nature of the demonic, that it's it's not only out to destroy humanity, uh, human individual human beings, but it also, in its very nature, destroys it. It's destroying itself because of who who Jesus is. Mm. Uh, there's something about the nature of the, the demonic. It's not the self-destructive nature. The self-destructive, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, then the, the, this whole episode then leads to the response of the, the herdsmen and they go yeah, into the, yeah, in the country yeah. and all the people can see what's happened. Um, yeah. This is, uh, I find this really, um, there's some incredible irony here. Yeah. They see the man sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they yeah. were afraid. Yeah. Now, here's something, here's something really strange, isn't it? That that here is a man who's really fearsome uh, and, yeah. and they're, they're terrified of him, which is why he lives out in the desert area amongst yeah. the tombs. So the things we, we, we find difficult to understand, the things we find terrifying, the things we find disturbing, we push them out into a, this other place over here. Yeah. But now Jesus has healed him, he's in the right mind, and they, find, they seem to find that even more terrifying. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're, they're, they've seen a terrifying power, and now they've met Jesus who is a greater power mm. and they're even more afraid. I mean, it just raises, I mean, there is a wonderful irony, but all, you think, oh, they're relieved. Oh, you know, this guy's going to come back and join the community. Um, but it, it is interesting as well that I don't think we would ever 
wants people to be terrified in their encounters with Jesus. No, no, uh, uh, no, absolutely. Yet they, that, yet these people are. Yeah, yeah. And I, a part of me wonders whether that what's going on here is that actually people are, it's better the devil you know than the, you know, than the devil well, you know. Well, literally. <laughs> yeah, that, that actually people prefer familiarity even with all its problems, yeah. with, with all its ambiguities, than than the freedom to you know the, the freedom and, and the new the new place that you will live mm. if, if you follow Jesus. And I think mm. in in people's responses to Jesus Christ in in you know which we see in evangelism that there is something there is something there about that yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, and we as a human beings we often do prefer the familiar uh, to to the transformational. Um, even even if it's even even it's a familiar which is fractured and disturbing and and, 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 and broken yeah. 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 yeah 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 I don't mm. know is that maybe that's what's going on yeah um, I really like I, I've I've really enjoyed um, amongst other commentaries Michael Parsons here in the Paideia series mm. and uh, he just makes a great comment um, sort of summarising and drawing together uh, the, the 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 response of fear and and of course the connection with the the sea as well because they've just they've just come across the sea and the, yeah. and the storm and everything and then the pigs yeah. go down in, into the sea and so on um and he says this jesus has the ultimate authority over evil whether that evil manifests itself in nature or in the life of the individual by the end of these stories the audience is hopefully much better prepared to answer the pressing question which we heard in the previous episode who can this man be yeah yeah now I've just noticed it noted in the blog that there are there's a huge amount. I mean, we've already done this a little bit. I mean, some of your answers I think are really interesting. Um, there's a huge amount of material here for reflection on the ministry of Jesus, particularly in the contemporary reflection. Mm. Um, uh, the first area, it seems to me that there's um, uh, I've used the language here, the significant presence of what I call dissociation. Mm in the sense that this man is dissociated. He's, he's, I know that just the language of dissociation has a kind of technical term in psychology, but he is a man who is cut off from his community. He is a man who is yeah. literally cutting his body. He is a man who is um, uh, just disturbed. He's, he's not at peace with himself. There's a dissociation within himself. Mm. Um, and the power of Jesus is to bring healing and connection and reconnection mm. so the man is in his right mind now the man is now at peace with his body so he's yeah. no longer harming himself. himself yeah and then jesus sends him back to to be reconnected with his community and it just seems to me that's mm. that's so significant pastry because it we it feels to me as though with all our, our wealth and our progress and our technology and so on we, we it feels in many ways we're a culture which suffers from that kind of dissociation we're isolated from our neighbor yeah um i'm going to be slightly provocative and say i just i just feels to me as though a lot of the debates around we have around sexuality mm -hmm. uh in contemporary society are, are about being arise from how many of us are ill at ease with our own bodies mm. um so it seems to me that the example of Jesus here, his ministry has a, an impact on all sorts of, of, of complex contemporary issues. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of reflection that could be could be done on that. Um, and I think the, the other the other interesting thing here is that we often, um, you know, the, 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 is, is, there's a challenge as well. I think there's an a, a missional challenge for the church, actually, which is that Jesus in the face of all sorts of things that were profoundly unclean for a Jew, tombs, Gentiles, swine, mm -hmm. etc. He goes into that kind of all guns blazing, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't regard them as risking. He doesn't regard himself as at risk from infection, from contamination, yeah. contamination. But, but, but he, it's actually he, his. It's his purity, purity. that, that mm -hmm. infects others in a good way, yeah. as it were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's really interesting, isn't it? That there's all sorts of places the church can sometimes be afraid to go, uh, and maybe some of those things that are, are ones that you mention. Yeah. Um, yeah. But actually, it, it works the other way round. Mm. Um, there's been a, a, a little bit of commentary in the area of disability theology. Uh, I know that mm. one person commented, and I've explored this in another blog. They said that. Um, uh, Jesus uses people's disability as a way of demonstrating his power and therefore actually is kind of obscuring them. I don't think that's happened at all. It does seem to me that in this narrative and in the others, 
the dignity of the man is is central and this yeah. is this is no exhibition and in fact mm. this happens of the disciples aren't mentioned they're obviously seeing what's going on but the, the people aren't there the, the, the people only see the result yeah of, that of, isn't of that interesting that this, the privacy of this encounter is fascinating yeah. isn't it yeah. yeah so i don't think jesus is is making use of this man's disability no, to, no, to to show no, no he's giving dignity mm. uh, and i think the third thing i just mentioned at the end of the blog is that um just as the disciples were terrified by the storm the local here hears respond with, with with fear and then what's interesting is that um uh, when they say jesus can you go away please he does yeah yeah if he you won't don't impose want... himself on them yeah, no 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 but he, he leaves the man not only restored but actually with a purpose and a mission yeah. i think it's tom yeah. wright says he becomes the first apostle so, to the gentiles, the gentiles yeah. yeah 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 and and it's interesting isn't it i mean this story is so um it, it has really passed into the english language i mean we have that phrase clothed and in your right mind you know, are you clothed in your right mind? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's an, it's an idiom in English, um, yeah. Yeah. and 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 that comes directly from from mm. this this story, which always interests me. That yeah. Mm. Great. Thank you very much, James. There's so much there to reflect on. Friends, mm. thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget to click on the like button. Don't forget to click on the share and pass it around. And don't forget to subscribe so that we can see you in future weeks as we seek week by week to bring the word to life. So it's a good bye from me. And it's good to from me. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> yes.